Hi guys, it's uh, Eddie from the desk here uh, in London. Um, some of you may have not seen me before. Uh, I'm actually involved in the other side of Amplify Trading's business, uh, basically covering capital markets. Um, but today we're going to be covering uh, top sector trends uh, for trading the coronavirus, uh, investing for the coronavirus. Um, so I'm going to be discussing some of the things that I've been watching uh, as it's kind of unfolded over the last few weeks and months. Um, and hopefully you'll take something away from uh, understanding about the different sectors and how they've responded to the coronavirus um, and identifying some long and short uh, opportunities and some short and longer term plays. So let's kick into it. Um, so the topics we're going to be covering today, uh, just to introduce myself, here's a picture of me uh, in Frankfurt actually last week um, covering equity capital markets trading through our IPO simulation for Morgan Stanley in Frankfurt. Um, so that's kind of my day-to-day uh, -day, uh, going around top inv investment banks and asset managers uh, and training their analysts uh, and interns. Uh, but I also deliver uh, our simulation technology all over the all over the world, really, um, at all different universities, LSE, Oxford, Cambridge, Assad, Frankfurt, uh, all over the world, really. Um, so today we're going to be covering uh, the market impact of uh, coronavirus, um, have a look at the S&P year-to-date performance and the daily performance today. Uh, I've actually been sat on the trading floor all day today, and it's been a pretty crazy, uh, cre crazy day. It's definitely been a crazy week. Um, very, very volatile. Um, so hopefully this is going to give you some insight into the movements of the different asset classes and why. Um, we're going to have a look at the typical economic cycle uh, and the impact on the different sectors. Um, we're going to go through an investing checklist for some companies I think you should be looking at or the characteristics and red flags um, for some companies that you should be looking at. Uh, we're going to discuss the fangs uh, and some top picks from, uh, from my perspective and what some companies that I'm looking at that could potentially benefit um, from this coronavirus, which is obviously um, kind of a terrible thing to say, um, where this is a crisis and obviously um, lots of people are getting ill and dying. Uh, which is very, very unfortunate. Of course, um, there are some companies that you can look at um, that can take advantage of this, uh, including things like Zoom, uh, video conferencing as people kind of work from home, but we'll get into that later. Um, I'm gonna have a look at the Fed policy. I think you can't talk about markets at the moment without uh, discussing the Fed monetary policy decision. Uh, I think it was just on Tuesday where they cut 50 basis points, which was very uh, shocking, uh, even though I actually wrote a LinkedIn post, I think three hours before, saying that they needed to cut now uh, and cut hard. And I think that's definitely one of my luckier calls timing-wise, where uh, it kind of they kind of uh, saw my post, I would, I'm sure, uh, and actually then did cut 50 basis points, which was quite shocking uh, to the market. But given the market pricing um, that I mentioned in the post, I think it was inevitable and they needed to do it uh, as there was a tightening in financial conditions. Uh, we're going to look at some of the uh, different sectors, um, so airlines, consumer staples, energy sectors, and some factors uh, that you should be looking out for if you're investing or trading in this environment. Um, so first of all, Let's have a look at the COVID-19 coronavirus impact. Um, there's been 100,000 cases now total confirmed. Um, but one thing that the media kind of don't talk about and they kind of like to, I don't want to say fear monger, um, but there's a lot of uh, 55,000, 56,000 people that have actually recovered from the virus. Um, I think the death rate or the official death rate um, is around 3%. Um, so it is not as bad as the media perhaps are making out to be. Uh, it's definitely something we should be watching and it's having a big impact on uh, financial markets. Um, people are going to get infected. I think that's, that's uh, definitely a reality now. Um, but I actually don't think the mortality rate um, is and the death rate is uh, as bad as maybe people fear. I think people will get infected, uh, but the majority of them will recover. Um, and I definitely think the impact of the COVID-19, the coronavirus, is going to be large. It's definitely, in my opinion, going to get worse before it gets better. Um, but I do think it's uh, temporary. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about this from a co company perspective. But I think for a lot of companies, there's going to be demand shocks, definitely. Um, but in a lot of uh, kind of scenarios, I think this demand is going to be delayed rather than completely destroyed. And I'll talk about uh, what companies that is and why. Um, but this is a call from JP Morgan just today, and I'm definitely uh, of the ilk to, to believe this as well. Um, over the last few days and this week, 
Volatility is back. Uh, even today, the VIX was trading at 50, um, which is quite alarming. And the S&P 500 has swung more uh, than 3%, five times in eight sessions. I think the Dow also had uh, the second largest point swing, where it was up 1,300 and then down 1,300. So definitely conditions that you should be wary of uh, when tr trying to you know, trade in this environment short term. Um, but I think that this could uh, potentially um, provide some opportunities for long-term investors if you're looking from a portfolio management perspective. Um, here's the S&P 500 year-to-date performance. So again, quite shocking actually, when you think about this has kind of been on the, the kind of news headlines so much and the kind of severe severity of the virus and how it's spreading. Um, but that, the impact on year-to-date performance of the S&P 500 is shocking when you actually look at it, um, where we see all these massive down days uh, in the US equity industry futures, uh, for example. But yet Amazon, Microsoft are up you know, four or five percent. Um, Apple, Google, pretty much flat on the year. Um, okay, uh, there has been some severe, uh, you know, uh, price movements for the energy sector. So Exxon is a company that I'm going to talk about later. Um, that's been beaten up. Uh, oil has just touched forty-one dollars a barrel, um, quite sharply down. I think it was down seven point five percent today. Uh, and I'll talk about why that is. Um, but this has definitely had an impact on some energy stocks. Um, the S&P uh, 500 today's performance, so you can see, or oh, it's a bit of a bloodbath. Um, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon down, you know, two percent, three percent. Again, it's the energy stocks are going to get hit um, from this kind of lower oil price uh, as a result of slower economic growth globally uh, and the implications of the virus, lower demand. So it was, I guess, a supply shock. Um, where it originated as that. So it would as, it's going to affect the supply chains of the tech names like you might have read for Apple, for example, and Amazon. Um, however, it has translated um, to lower oil prices for oil stocks as well. Um, the traditional economic impact um, of the cycle uh, on different sectors I believe we are kind of entering this kind of recessionary phase. Um, but here's just a breakdown of the different sectors. So financials, consumer discretionary, technology, industrials, materials, consumer staples, healthcare, energy, telecom, and utilities. Um, and then in this kind of recessionary phase, defensive sectors tend to outperform. Um, so your consumer staples, utilities, telecoms, healthcare, uh, they produce a kind of consumer staples, so your toothpaste, phone services, energy, prescription drugs. Just because we're in a recession, uh, people need uh, their prescription drug, uh, drugs, they need electricity, they're not going to slow their demand and they tend to do quite well in this type of environment. Um, utility stocks, um, I'm going to talk about that just later in this kind of video, um, but they tend to have higher dividend yields, um, which can you know provide some return for investors as they kind of seek seek the safety of a you know a stable uh, dividend um the underperformers tend to be those kind of cyclical names so industrials technology uh, and those consumer discretionary think kind of luxury goods things like that um, and as you can see by this graphic you can see the uh, the kind of uh, sectors and then the impact where we get to that kind of late and recessionary phase um, just some names, just so you can kind of put some names to the sectors. Uh, so we've got Exxon, of course, uh, down very big, I think down 35% year to date um, as, a, as a result of the kind of factors I talked about, the oil price, the global uh, growth picture slowing down, uh, Boeing, uh, United Technologies, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble. These are some big names in the sectors that you can see, um, just so you can put some kind of uh, context to it again the probably more uh, common or well-known fang names so facebook amazon netflix google etc of course sitting in the kind of information technology and communications sector um, and obviously the performances of these sectors tends to differ in this type of environment um, i think the essential uh, things that you should be looking at and i've kind of got a laundry list here um, when you are trading and investing in this environment i think the attractive characteristics of companies that you should be looking for definitely are low leverage companies, companies with strong balance sheets, those with secular headwind, uh, tailwind, sorry, uh, so things like te uh, technology, strong and stable cash flow, their high ability to service their debt and their interest payments. So high things like high interest coverage ratio, so EBIT to interest expense, high cash flow to debt ratios, things like that. Look for quality companies with strong balance sheets. 
if this uh, kind of coronavirus epidemic is temporary, which I believe it will be, uh, and a lot of commentators do believe, and fingers crossed it is temporary, this demand is not going to be eliminated. It's just going to be pushed uh, to later quarters and perhaps 2021. So what you need to do is identify companies that are able to withstand this temporary demand shock uh, because they will have a big bounce, uh, let's say, in six months' time, hopefully, um, for example, if the virus then does start to kind of weaken in its severity. The potential red flags, I would say, um, are highly levered. And of course, this has been emphasized, the amount of corporate debt uh, has ballooned uh, just as a result of this cheap money, aka low interest rates globally. Those com uh, companies with weak balance sheets, so low cash that aren't able to uh, kind of they don't, they're not very solvent, they're not very liquid. Um, you know, they have weakened uh, kind of volatile cash flow. So temporary demand shocks um, through revenue and then obviously flowing to their cash flows, they're gonna be in quite a lot of trouble. Um, so those companies with those low interest coverage ratios, low cash flow to debt, um, you're gonna want to, from my opinion, stay away from. Um, again, most sensitive. Uh, you see it, the travel, so your cruise, cruises, your airline, so Deutsche Lufthansa expect over the next few weeks, they just announced that they're going to have 50% less capacity over the next few weeks. Those kind of um, companies tied to large events and then global growth, uh, definitely. So let's have a look at some of the FANG names. So the FANGs, obviously your Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Um, they represent obviously the most popular and best performing. I think Microsoft and Google, um, names like that, were up up to 90% last year. Um, they have pulled back. Uh, and I think from a long-term portfolio management um, perspective, you should be looking at these names definitely. Um, from a shorter term perspective, I do believe in my opinion that they do have some more uh, downside. Um, but if you're looking, um, you know, if you were looking at these companies in Q4 last year, you know, they had an incredible run. Um, so if you were looking at these names at those levels, uh, some of them have fallen, you know, 20% uh, over the last few days or weeks. Um, so if you're looking from a long term portfolio management perspective, these could be good times uh, to add to your portfolio. Um, you shouldn't try and time the market. You're going you could get hurt and you probably will get hurt. Um, trying to catch a falling knife, um, is gonna, is gonna hurt. Um, but if you're looking from a long-term perspective and you do believe that this virus is temporary, uh, which I do, and lots of big commentators do, then these names are going to come roaring back. Um, their supply chains will be affected, uh, and demand will be weaker, uh, over these next few months. Um, but from a valuation perspective, they are extremely elevated. If you look at median to enterprise value to sales, uh, and if you look historically, these names are extremely uh, rich in their value um, from some metrics perspective. Uh, my top picks, so the coronavirus winners, uh, if you want to call them that, um, Galeed, uh, so they're actually producing late stage trials to evaluate uh, the artificial medicine uh, as a curative treatment for the disease. And they've had a really good run recently. Um, names like Zoom, uh, Zoom and Slack uh, are two names where um, you've seen that some major corporations, so Deloitte, Goldman Sachs, HSBC, for example, have been saying to their employees, you need to work from home now. Um, so I definitely think Z Z uh, companies like Zoom, Slack have really big upside potential, but Zoom, for example, was up a lot last year. So it is very elevated and quite uh, rich in its valuation um, already. Um, but I do think there is some more short, short term upside as people seek to work from home. They're going to need to uh, video conference. They're going to need to uh, communicate with their teams and Slack uh, and Zoom are two good ways of doing this. Lyft and Uber, they've been really beaten up. And I think this is uh, tied to you know, if people aren't flying, people aren't traveling, then the majority of their revenues are actually transporting people, of course, around the cities, but also picking people up from airports and things like that. Um, Lyft and Uber had a big, bit of a rebound in the second half of last year. And I know JP Morgan, for example, and some big banks have actually said, you know, they've fallen 20 or so percent this year as a result of this coronavirus that demand shock. Um, you know, they've got a really good opportunity if you believe in that secular kind of trend um, that they, they're obviously participating in.
the cloud names, so again, the ones we just talked about, Alphabet, Amazon, uh, Adobe, Microsoft, they all have a lot, uh, a large proportion of their revenues being uh, kind of uh, generated by cloud services. So if you believe that the cloud services and kind of um, that kind of technology technological angle is going to be um, you know, facilitated during this crisis, these are good names uh, to look at. Uh, another point for Lyft and Uber is uh, the margins that they can generate. Um, if people are not taking the subway or the tube, um, there could be attractive uh, options for Lyft and Uber, right? Um, so if you don't want to take the tube, you might call an Uber. Uh, as that demand potentially starts to rise and I saw some uh, screenshots of some Uber and Lyft rides that were actually uh, $160 just from one end of New York to another. Um, this is obviously uh, the surcharges that they're implementing as a result of the demand of people not want, wanting to kind of take the subway at, uh, as they fear that it, may, they, it might put them at you know, a higher risk of you know, uh, conducting the virus. Um, so these are my top picks of names that I'm looking at right now. Again, Alibaba, similar story, people staying at home, your Netflix. Um, again, people consuming these uh, at home, um, mobile doctors, for example, that have seen a big uh, kind of lift in China. Um, so people kind of want, wanting to discuss their symptoms with an online GP. Um, again, these are names that you should be looking at, or at least I'm looking at. Um, ut utilities have had a, you know, have remained particularly resilient. Um, so they're the only sector uh, still positive year to day. As you can see from the Euro stocks year to day, they're up about 10%. Travel and leisure, automobiles, oil and gas, you know, the, the biggest losers uh, from this group. Uh, and they tend to perform well during recessionary climates. Uh, recession or not, you need energy like we just talked about. And you've seen uh, the top performers, EDF Energy up 34% year to date, National Grid up 10%. The lower yields uh, and the lower yield environment like we've just seen, the US 10 year hitting 0.75%. Uh, or even lower, 0.66% today. Uh, German Bunds at negative 0.7% today. Investors like the fact that utilities do offer high dividend yields uh, in those kind of highly regulated kind of industries. Um, they do typically offer investors more stable and consistent dividends from that perspective and less price volatility. So this is something, a sector that's kind of outperformed uh, recently relative to the rest of the market. Again, we can't talk about uh, markets at the moment without the Fed. Um, this move did shock the market, and this graphic basically indicates when the Fed and Bank of China both cut rates by 50% uh, in the same month. Um, obviously, there was some tough times that kind of and ensued from that. I think uh, dot-com bubble uh, and financial crisis. Um, I think they had no choice um, but to loosen financial conditions as they were too tight given the market pricing. Um, but again, this has major implications for banks, for example. Um, this is going to put severe pressure on their net interest margins, even though the volatility that's ensued uh, at the moment you know, will, uh, in my opinion, uh, definitely provide upside for trading revenues and trading profits. Uh, and the lower rates may actually uh, kind of stimulate a refinancing boom. Uh, so think mortgages, for example, if you can refinance your mortgage at a lower rate now, uh, that's going to be attractive. So banks, um, we're going to talk about later, um, but this is going to you know, provide some uh, headwinds uh, for them potentially. Uh, this is just a graphic showing the US 10 year that I just mentioned, this gravitational pull uh, towards 0%. I think with the interest rate differentials around the world, uh, in Europe, in Japan, I think this is now uh, a done deal. And I think US rates are heading uh, to 0%. We saw the biggest one day drop uh, since 2009 on the 30 year yield, Bunds at 0.75%, negative 0.75%. U.S. 10 years is down 55% in two weeks. Uh, I think this is a majority of different factors, but I think people reallocating capital uh, from the equity markets uh, to the bond markets, and this has kind of seen this big move uh, downwards in yields, upwards in price. The Euro stock bank index, like I was just talking about, stocks, uh, bank stocks in Europe and the US will tend to move with yields. Uh, and in this case, it's going to be downwards. There's going to be the pressure on the net interest margins. Trading revenues will be up, 
Um, but central banks, I think, have a, a mandate to ensure the liquidity and availability of credit for these small to medium sized uh, enterprises to ensure that this doesn't uh, kind of this market, uh, I don't want to say panic, uh, but volatility translates into the financial system. They need the Federal Reserve and central banks across the world need to ensure that there is that availability of credit for small to medium sized enterprises so they can facilitate um, the kind of temporary demand shocks uh, to their re revenues and cash flows. US banks, like uh, like I just kind of mentioned, they're not doing much better. The, the uh, Eurostox Bank Index is 20, down 25% in 13 trading days. Uh, and this is definitely mirrored uh, by US banks. They're down around 22% uh, from that February 2020 high. Um, this is all the things I've just been talking about in terms of their kind of the pressure on the banks. Consumer staples, so there are some uh, winners from this coronavirus, like I mentioned uh, in, a, in a previous slide, but Costco uh, and Kroger actually reported their earnings uh, yesterday. Uh, and this is a short-term play uh, on the temporary demand. You know, people are going to these supermarkets uh, and actually hoarding, uh, you know, disinfectant gel, toilet paper. Uh, and in their latest earnings res results, they actually mentioned that the uptick in demand had a 3% positive impact uh, on the total and comparable sales. So they're seeing a big upside. So these are two names that you should be looking at, uh, Costco and Kroger, um, up over the last few days. Um, but still, I do think if this persists, which I obviously will, um, there's gonna be a, you know, a shift in demand um, you know, to the near term. Um, quite different to Apple. Uh, so like I was talking about, the demand is not gonna be eliminated in my opinion for iPhones and uh, iPads, for example. It's just gonna be delayed. Um, so there is more short-term pain, I believe, for the fang names like Apple um, due to the supply chain kind of uh, disruptions. Um, but I think that demand will come back online and people will start to demand iPhone 11s, for example, uh, just in later quarters when hopefully this virus has passed. Um, the big trade at the moment, uh, like you've seen, is airlines. Um, so the jet ETF has dropped 14 in the last 15 sessions. Uh, it's down about 30% in the last 10 days, uh, matching the impact of the 9-11 aftermath, which is obviously terrible. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, Deutsche Lufthansa, uh, they've announced that their flight capacity is down 50% uh, in the coming week. So airlines are getting hit quite severely um, you know, on this kind of virus. Uh, and here's a graphic showing the turbulence ahead potentially for airlines, pardon the pun. Um, the limited spread uh, scenario, so this implies a 63 billion loss of passenger revenues. That's 11% worldwide in 2020. Uh, a critical spread of the virus scenario uh, estimates a 113 billion loss uh, of passenger revenues, 19% worldwide in 2020. So uh, I think this is uh, definitely a short-term short. -term short. Uh, airlines are going to continue to be hit uh, as a result of this kind of uh, kind of people attending and traveling uh, events, for example, is going to be down. Um, so they're going to get hit. Um, but there will be a point where these airlines, particularly those that are strong, uh, with strong balance sheets and cash flows, like I mentioned, uh, are going to be resilient and they will be the winners uh, when this virus is over, if they can withstand this temporary kind of demand shock. So the bull case um, is previous disease outbreaks uh, have peaked after one to three months. Uh, and there's no way of telling if coronavirus is gonna you know, be done before the summer in three months. It's not looking that likely. Um, but the point is they've recovered to pre-outbreak levels previously, historically, uh, as a good indicator, six to seven months after. Um, so if you're looking uh, at these kind of strong uh, kind of balance sheet positioned companies, um, there could be some good opportunities there uh, for a bounce uh, if you're a long-term investor. Again, oil prices down 7.5% uh, today, $242 a barrel. This is going to have massive uh, implications for the energy sector. Um, so they're down big. Um, Exxon is, is down about 30% year to date. Um, and it, you can see the energy sector XLE ETF is coming to a really key level, um, a 10 year key level. Um, but there's going to be um, some opportunities, I think, for long term investors. So names like Exxon Mobile, 
they're trading at a very attractive three times EBITDA with a 6.7% dividend yield. Uh, and this is a common phrase kind of in markets is don't buy a company just for its yield because it could be wiped out in one day like we've seen over the last few days. Um, but there will be um, some opportunities for companies like Exxon that have been historically profitable if they can diversify their revenues uh, and their business models into this cleaner energy um, kind of hydrogen uh, renewables if they can pivot uh, to these uh, kind of areas for the long term I think they could be in a really good position and this could be a potential long-term play um, for the near term I think short term um, there's going to be some more pain for these energy names and it is approaching this key level uh, here um, but if you are a long-term investor definitely names to look at the factors to watch out for so this is kind of winding down to the end of this video um, but the virus is indirectly causing the drop in yields uh, and the causing the volatility that we see uh, and it is the potential and I think when why markets are reacting the way they do um, is because there is potential for this to lead to a recession okay it's not directly causing the stock markets to fall but it's indirectly triggering the potential for a recession for example in the US uh, and a dramatic revision downwards uh, to global growth um, when you look globally um, Asia obviously China the most severely affected but I think there could be some more downside because I believe that um, I think people are pricing in the the kind of impact to the Chinese uh, you know country and markets um, but we haven't really seen it too uh, prominent in Europe and the United States yet um, so if you look at it from that perspective if markets have reacted the way they have uh, to just the outbreak in kind of uh, China and Asia and kind of slowly spreading into the Europe and US what happens when you know there is a you know it hits the peak severity for uh, Europe and the US? You know how are people going to feel? I think the P uh, in the price to earnings ratios have to come down dramatically. Uh, last year we had uh, we saw huge multiple expansion, and I think if there is revisions down to earnings, that kind of denominator in the price to earnings ratio. This is when uh, we could see real carnage in markets, I believe. Um, if we do see revisions down, um, I think heading into the year, people were kind of expecting earnings to remain resilient or um, you know, slightly to the upside. If there are earnings revisions downwards, we're going to see um, you know, equity markets definitely react to this. If, like we saw today, we saw $41 uh, a barrel oil, if we do see $30 a barrel oil, this is going to lead to a lot of bankruptcies. Um, the break-even rate um, for the US companies is around $40. So how long they can remain resilient in that kind of uh, oil condition uh, will remain to be seen. Um, I think the availability of credit and liquidities small to medium-sized enterprises in Europe, in the United States, if the banks can't lend to them or you know they kind of pull back their liquidity, there's going to need to be action uh, like we've seen in, East, in, in Europe with the ECB uh, announcing tiltros. I think there could be you know similar measures taken by the Fed. You know they've only got 100 basis points now to play with from a monetary policy perspective. There's talks about fi fiscal uh, stimulus packages, but again that has to be uh, passed obviously by uh, Congress. So the president takes it to Congress, um, and there's obviously uh, doubts about due to the partisan nature of uh, the Republicans and Democrats, whether that would even pass. So I think the key now for kind of uh, the Federal Reserve and central banks all, all over the world is that availability of credit. Um, the financial system has to remain um, to provide liquidity, to basically um, provide a buffer for these companies to withstand um, these short-term temporary, uh, hopefully, uh, demand shocks to their revenues and their, and their bottom lines. Um, we will see uh, continued volatility, um, but I think the key indicator for that um, is it is bearish. I think we saw some big updates. So yesterday, the um, you know equity indice futures were up around five percent, um, and you know you, you kind of think, oh, everything's great again um, from a psychological perspective. Um, but we tend to see these kind of big moves upwards after multiple down days, 
um, in times of severe stress. So the financial crisis, um, the dot-com bubble, and even going back to the 1930s and the Great Depression, this is when we see these kind of wild bounces and wild swings in markets. Um, I think this is not a financial um, you know, financial services issue at the moment. Um, but just remember, or it's worth uh, kind of remembering that um, the mortgage-backed securities crisis, um, this was actually not, you know, due to the banks, right? It was the mortgage market that kind of caused this tight, severe tightening of financial conditions and illiquidity in the market. So definitely be watching uh, financial institutions at the moment. Credit spreads are continuing to widen. Uh, and right now, just today, we saw the US credit market uh, ga gauge surge more than um, the least, the most since uh, at least 2011. Um, so these are the key factors uh, to look, look out for. Um, if you enjoyed this video, I know we touched on a lot of subjects. If you want to see more videos, please like, subscribe uh, the channel, leave your comments if you enjoyed it or if you wanted me to elaborate on more points or make more videos on different topics. We have covered a lot, um, but definitely leave your comment below uh, and we'll uh, get some more videos out there. Thanks.